Hello everyone and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this legal education content, and today is the day I earn that subscription. For today's story, we are dealing with a new decision out of the Fifth Circuit, which deals with social media companies such as Twitter, or Facebook, or LinkedIn, or Instagram, or TikTok, or insert your social media apparatus of choice. The social media groups, as we all know, have been taking it upon themselves to be the regulators of speech for quite some time now, determining who they will and will not platform. They generally platform everybody, but of course they have used their power to exclude certain people from the internet. And perhaps more troubling, at least to the state of Texas, is it seems that this seems to be a bit based on particular viewpoints, on particular opinions. So while we might exclude people for some sort of malicious conduct on one hand, then that might be understandable. Texas believes the social media companies are excluding people or at least providing, uh, applying their rules in an inconsistent way based on viewpoints. In other words, they're more likely to exclude conservative or Republican or right-leaning people than the counterpart. And so Texas passed a law to deal with this. And we're going to read the specifics of the law. But basically, in so many words, and we'll get into the details, of course, it's preventing the social media companies from kicking people off the platforms for viewpoint-based reasons. So you could still exclude them for criminal behavior, could still exclude them for malicious behavior, could still exclude them for harming your network in terms of like physicality or denial of service tax or things like that. You could still deny them for you know, any sort of illegal problems, but not merely for viewpoint. And this, of course, was challenged in the courts. It was challenged facially. It was challenged by the social media companies saying that on its face, this was an improper regulation on the First Amendment. It was denying the networks their ability to control their networks and determine who they would and would not have on, and thus was harming their free speech rights. Okay, so the trial court, the district court, said, all right, I'm going to issue the injunction. The Court of Appeals reverses, and I have taken a look at this, and I think it has some pretty persuasive reasoning. So we're going to, I mean, I've skimmed it at least because I highlighted it in advance so that we know what to talk about. So I, 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 I read it in so much as I skimmed it to know what, it, what we would be talking about, but I haven't really read it. So we're going to read it in more detail, and we're going to understand together. We're going to see how this reasoning goes and whether or not it might survive further challenge. All right, so let's go ahead and get started immediately with this. We are in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the great states of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi are the states that are within the Fifth Circuit. This decision just came down on Friday. It is net choice versus Ken Paxton in his official capacity as the Attorney General of Texas. And the court begins with a brief summary of how we got to here this place. A Texas statute, which was named House Bill 20, generally prohibits large social media platforms from censoring speech based on the viewpoint of the speaker. The platform's urges to hold the statute is facially unconstitutional, which means that it would be unconstitutional basically in every possible application. That's what a facial challenge is, right? As opposed to an as-applied challenge. A facial challenge is it is unconstitutional or invalid in some sense in basically every possible way as opposed to an as-applied challenge where it's like, well, the law's not generally invalid, but it's invalid as to me for specific reasons. So this is being challenged facially. It's being saying it's invalid as to basically its entire scope in every possible application. That's a facial challenge. So they're urging the statute to be held facially unconstitutional and thus would not be applied to anyone at any time under any circumstances. That would be in the nature of the facial challenge, right? It is, it is not applicable ever, so never apply it. Okay. In urging this sweeping relief, the platforms offer a rather odd inversion of the First Amendment. The amendment, of course, protects every person's right to the freedom of speech, and we've spent more than enough time on this channel talking about the freedom of speech with particular attention to the word the, but we'll skip that for the moment and read on. That amendment, of course, protects every person's right to the freedom of speech, but the, pro the platforms argue that buried somewhere in a person's enumerated right to freedom of speech lies a corporation's unenumerated right to muzzle speech. So yeah, that's a, a, an interesting take on the whole thing, right? We have a right to speak. 
We also have a right to muzzle other people's speech. Okay. The implications of this argument are staggering, right? So what are the implications of this, right? So what it, this is always a good test in, in law, generally speaking. You need to ask yourself in law, where does it stop? Because we work on a precedential system in the United States. We work on a common law system. And when we have a rule or a standard, we're going to apply that standard infinitely. And so the question is, well, can we do that without breaking it? Can you apply the standard infinitely without breaking it? And if not, what are the limiting principles? How do you limit this thing, right? And a lot of these issues, of course, have been ironed out over the last thousand years or so in varying degrees where we know some of the limitations and not. So the long, hard slog has taught us a lot of the limitations and taught us a lot of the boundaries to the point where some things are so well established, we call them black letter law because they're basically, well, it's what, you know, they write in the books because there's nothing left to say. But of course, in new domains, in new contexts, we have to ask the question anew. What is the standard here? So, okay, social media companies, you have the right to muzzle speech. Let's take that premise and run with it. What would be the implications of that argument if taken true? So the court says the implications are staggering. On the platform's view, email providers, mobile phone companies, and banks could cancel the accounts of anyone who sends an email, makes a phone call, or spends money in support of a disfavored political party, candidate, or business. That would seem to be a logical extension of the argument. And if it's not, why not? Where does it stop? What's more, the platforms argue that businesses can acquire a dominant market position by holding themselves out as open to everyone, as Twitter did when it started in long, long, long ago in the far, far away, as Twitter did in championing itself as the free speech wing of the free speech party. That was Twitter's original thing. So yeah, so they can hold themselves out at that, get themselves some sort of market position, but then having cemented itself as a monopolist of the modern public square, which Twitter has been called before, Twitter unapologetically argues it could turn around and ban all pro-LGBT speech, or for that matter, all anti-LGBT speech, because of course, principles apply both ways, for no other reason than its employees want to pick on members of that community. So we can hold ourselves out in one way, gain customers in one way, and then once we cement ourselves as the town square, which again, the US Supreme Court has used that language with respect to Twitter. Once we become the modern town square, we can turn it right around and say, nah, so the Fifth Circuit's like, okay, that's odd. And this logic would also, as they note, apply to banks or the phone company or email providers or basically any other private enterprise. They could censor you merely for your viewpoints. So the argument goes, there's no logical stopping point. If this is a First Amendment argument, which is Twitter's whole point, right? It's not statutory at this point, it's First Amendment. And the nature of constitutions, of course, is to kind of permeate everything. It's kind of the point of the First Amendment, and for the rest, for that matter, the rest of the Constitution, it kind of impacts all the things. So rather than interpreting a statute which might have its own limitations, we're, we're trying to apply the First Amendment. And, that, and naturally, by the virtue of it being an amendment, it kind of breaks everything else, which is kind of the point. It's supposed to. So the, the reach is potentially infinite. It goes to all possible domains if the logic holds. I mean, yeah, that's that's a concern. So the court says today we reject the idea that corporations have freewheeling First Amendment right to censor what people say. Okay, because the district court held otherwise, we reverse the injunction. Okay, so that's basically the too long didn't watch part of the the exercise. So for those of you who want the headline summary, you just got it. For those of you who want the more in-depth legal education as to the rationale, we will continue. All right. So first let's go with the exact text of the statute, or at least the ones that matter, the parts of them the statute, the statute that matters, right? Whenever we're doing any sort of interpretation, whether it's the constitution, regulation, statute, city ordinance, whatever, 
it's always a good place to start with the text. What does the text say is always a really good place to start. Okay, let's do that. Two sections of HB 20 provide the following. First is section seven, which addresses viewpoint censorship. So here's what the state of Texas wrote in its legislation. A social media platform may not censor a user, a user's expression, or a user's ability to receive the expression of another user based on the viewpoint of that user or another person, the viewpoint represented in the user's expression or another person's expression, or a user's geographic location in this state or any part of the state. So we are prohibiting viewpoint-based discrimination. Now, the concept of viewpoint-based discrimination is well understood, although it's understood as it applies to the government. And now we're talking about a private actor which raises concerns. But at least if we're talking about what is a viewpoint, then we have at least a lot of case law to work from. Because to the extent we can, we can just copy paste, right? It's like, ooh, look, all this case law that deals with the government about viewpoints. Ah, oh, that's what viewpoints are. Copy paste, now I'll just apply that in this context. Okay, we can, we can do that. And then the question of course is, well, is that legal or constitutional? Can we copy paste? Okay, let's press on. The other relevant provision of the law is section two. It imposes disclosure and operational requirements on the platforms. Okay, so you have to tell us some things. You have to make certain kinds of representations. What are those? These requirements fall into three categories. First, the platforms must disclose how they moderate and promote content and publish an acceptable use policy. Okay, the policy must inform users about the type of content allowed on the platform explain how the platform enforces its policy, and describe how users can notify the platform of content that violates the policy. So step one, social media platforms. Provide a policy. Tell users what the policy is. Tell users how they can notify you if there's a problem. Okay. Platforms must also publish a biannual transparency report. The report must contain various high-level statistics related to content moderation efforts, including the number of instances in which the platform was alerted to the presence of pilot policy violating content, how the platform was alerted, how many times the platform acted against the content, and how many such actions were successful or unsuccessfully appealed. Last, the platforms must maintain and must maintain a compliance and appeals system for users. When a platform user, when a platform receives user submit content, it must generally explain the reason to the user in a written statement issued concurrent with removal. So if they remove you, they have to tell you why. It must also permit the user to appeal the removal and provide a response to the appeal within 14 business days. This is of course broad outlines, but that's basically what the law says. Fine. So the district court in analyzing these questions held that section two is facially unconstitutional. It would be unconstitutional in all of its possible domains. That's the nature of a facial unconstitutionality. The district court reasoned that section two disclosure and operation provisions are inordinately burdensome given the unfathomably large number of posts on the sites and apps. Okay. Further, the court reasoned that Section 2 will chill the social media platform speech by disincentivizing viewpoint-based censorship, which, to be fair, is kind of exactly what Texas is trying to do. So, yes. Again, the court did not explain why the facial challenge was appropriate, so the Fifth Circuit chiding the district court, other than by stating it imposes an onerless, onerously burdensome disclosure and operational requirement. So they didn't explain what the problem was other by, than by saying it's onerous. Maybe not the most complete reasoning we've ever seen. The district court, of course, also found that HB 20 discriminated on content and speaker because it permits censorship of some kind of content, like specific threats of violence directed at protected class, and only applies to large social media platforms. So one of the things that Texas wrote is only applied to social media um, providers of certain sizes. So this was written and meant to apply to all the social media providers that you've heard about, but not apply to mom and pop websites or mom and pop whatever. This is only meant to apply to the big boys. Okay, it then held it fails at any level of scrutiny. So say at the district court. All right, so what is the Court of Appeals gonna do? We review the district court's preliminary injunction for abuse of discretion. 
a preliminary injunction. Okay, so abusive discretion is what we have to hit. So what is the trial court supposed to do? A preliminary injunction is an extraordinary remedy that only may be awarded upon a clear showing that they're entitled to relief. This is the standard as we know and love from preliminary injunctions. They are definitionally extraordinary. They are not ever required by law because they are an equitable remedy. So you're never entitled to one and they are considered an extraordinary remedy. It's not what we're supposed to do normally. And for that matter, we don't do them normally. Injunctions are rare. The only place that they are somewhat common is in the domestic violence arena in which the states have passed very specific legislation regarding those specific kinds of restraining orders, but otherwise not so much on the uh, preliminary injunction. So the, the Court of Appeals deals with the First Amendment overbreath doctrine. First issue, this is overbroad. It sweeps in too much stuff. All right. It, the district court offers a facial constitutional remedy that protects speech, or I think the statute it does. It does not apply here because of Section 7, it chills anything, it chills censorship. So it doesn't chill speech, it chills censorship. So, no. And the platform's parade of whataboutisms proves their real complaint is purely speculative about how it will be enforced. The Court of Appeals is not buying the various parade of horribles that the social media organizations are selling. And just to be clear, it's perfectly reasonable to go through the parade of horribles because as I mentioned earlier, we work on a common law system. And you have to think about where does it stop? What are the lines? And so Twitter or anyone else asking about where does this stop is prefer perfectly valid. Now, the statute itself might provide an answer to that issue, and it does at least in part, because now we're back to interpreting the statute again. So where does it stop? Well, go read the statute. That provides some limitations there. Those limitations may or may not be constitutional, but at least there's some answers. But the argument itself isn't inherently invalid. The challenge is premised on First Amendment overbreath doctrine. Under the doctrine, the Supreme Court has recognized a second type of facial challenge where a law may be invalidated is overbroad if a substantial number of applications are unconstitutional, judged in relation to the state's plainly legislative sweep. So it doesn't necessarily have to be every possible application, but it has to be a lot of them. And when they say substantial, it has to be a really high number. So I, you're looking well more than half. So if it's well more than half, you, you're gonna have problems. I mean, that's at least how I would parse the relevant case law. Overbreath is a judicially created doctrine designed to prevent chilling of protected expression. We are concerned about any regulation that deals with the First Amendment because we want to make sure that we are not censoring or forbidding protected expression. There is, of course, unprotected expression. We've discussed that from time to time, but we wanna make sure whatever regulation we're doing doesn't overly burden vis-a-vis -vis the thing we're trying to solve. You know, we don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. Consistent with overbreath, the Supreme Court has applied it only when there's a, a substantial risk the challenge law will chill protected speech or association. Okay. The overbreath doctrine does not apply to Section 7, according to the Court of Appeals. That's for three reasons. First, the primary concern of overbreath is to avoid chilling speech. Right, this is the problem we're concerned about. We're concerned there might be a statute that's making certain kinds of speech illegal. And we're concerned that the, the, spe the statute or regulation or whatever might sweep in too much stuff and it might sweep in protected stuff. So that is our concern that it would chill protected speech because it's overbroad. But section seven, according to the Court of Appeals, doesn't chill speech, it chills censorship. So the concern is not really on point. I mean, there's a fair point to be had there. So there can be no concern that declining to facially invalidate will inhibit the marketplace of ideas because Texas is trying to increase the marketplace of ideas. We're trying to create more speech. We're trying to have more viewpoints expressed. This argument is like, well, we're trying to further the fundamental purpose of the First Amendment, not work against it. Okay. 
The platforms argue that their censorship somehow should be construed as speech. That is the nature of the argument. It's unavoidably their argument that the censorship itself is speech. That's the only way this works argumentatively. So yes, that would be what they're trying to argue. But even stipulating for the sake of argument that censorship can enjoy a First Amendment protection, okay, it is a far cry from pure speech that's the core concern of overbreath. I, yeah, I mean, restricting what other people are saying is not really pure speech, which deals with what people are saying. There is, there is some tension there. At most, the platform's censorship is, in the district court's words, a way that online services express themselves in the community standards. Sandra Ramirez gives 20 uncivilian memberships. Thank you very, very much for that very, very generous donation. It is extremely appreciated. Thank you for helping everyone become the uncivilians. Thus, that is, censorship is at best a form of expressive conduct for with overbreath only provides attenuated protection. It's not really speech, it's more conduct. You're you're protecting, you're preventing someone from speeching that speaking, that's a more of a a conduct issue. I, I mean you're you're blotting their words. That's more conduct. Okay. Tellingly, the platforms have pointed to no case applying overbreath to censorship. Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. Secondly, overbreath application is meant to protect third parties who cannot undertake the burden of as applied litigation and whose speech is likely to be chilled. The rationale for overbreath is wholly in opposite here. First of all, there are no third parties to chill. The plaintiff's trade association represents all the platforms covered by the relevant law. Additionally, unlike individual citizens potentially subject to criminal sanctions, who are the usual beneficiaries of overbreath rulings, the entire subjects to HB 20 are large, well-heeled corporations that have hired armadas of attorneys from some of the best law firms in the world to protect their rights to censor. So they can protect themselves on an as-applied challenge. Not only are criminal sanctions unavailable, damages are unavailable. Under the relevant state law, the attorney general can ask for an injunction, but no damages. So it's just to facilitate more speech. It's hard to see how platforms, which has already shown willingness to stand on their rights, as they've done right now, will be so chilled by the prospect of declaratory and injunctive relief that the facial remedy, remedy is justified. They've shown more than a little bit of willingness to fight and they can protect themselves if the occasion arises. Because again, Texas wrote this only to apply to the biggest social media networks. Third, the platforms principally argue against the law by speculating about the most extreme hypothetical applications. Such whataboutism further exemplifies why it's inappropriate to hold a law facially unconstitutional in a pre-enforcement posture. Texas enacted the law to address the platform's evolution into internet censors. Explaining the perceived need for the law, Texas and its amici cite numerous instances in which platforms have censored what Texas contends is pure political speech. I don't think they had to reach very hard to find examples. For example, one amicus brief documents the platform's censorship of 15 prominent celebrities and political figures, including five who were holding elected, elect, federal elected office. And then I did enjoy this detail that that argument came as a result of an amici Curie brief from the Babylon Bee. I, I enjoyed that detail. The Babylon Bee over here literally changed case law. Okay, I mean, that's fun. Texas also points to the platform's discrimination against Americans in favor of foreign adversaries and censorship of even congressional hearings that feature disfavored viewpoints. Again, if you're looking for the networks and social media networks trying to censor people for what seems to be purely political speech and disfavored viewpoints, I don't think you're gonna have to reach very hard. The platforms do not directly engage with any of these concerns, that would be difficult. Instead, their primary contention, beginning on page one of their brief, and repeated throughout, and at oral argument, 
is that we should declare the law facially invalid because it prohibits platforms from censoring pro-Nazi speech, terrorist propaganda, and Holocaust denials. Yeah, we literally godwin this argument. We literally godwin this argument is what the social media companies did. They said, hey, wait a second, how about Hitler? Again, I'm all in favor of going to the end of the page, but you know, maybe pick a different example than Hitler because it's so tired. It's so tired. It's like, oh, what about the pro-Nazi propaganda? You know, not to put too fine a point on it, but the First Amendment does protect pro-Nazi propaganda from the government. That's Stokey, Illinois, when the ACLU actually defended. They went to court to fight for the rights of Nazis to parade in the streets. The ACLU, and now it's been a hot minute since the ACLU did that, but they did. They went to the bat, they went to bat for the right of Nazis to have a parade in Skokie, Illinois. And they won because being pro-Nazi is just a viewpoint and the government can't discriminate based on viewpoints. So if from a First Amendment perspective, what about the pro-Nazi argument doesn't even work, which is kind of mildly hilarious. Also, it's just a tired example, pick something else. Far from justifying pre-enforcement facial invalidation, the platform's obsession with terrorists and Nazis proved the opposite. The Supreme Court has instructed that in determining whether a law is facially invalid, we should avoid speculating about hypothetical or imaginary cases. Overbreath doctrine has a tendency to summon forth endless stream of fanciful hypotheticals, and this case is no exception. But it's improper exercise of judicial power to say that the hypothetical cases are controlling. Again, in overbreath, we're just trying to prove it impacts a substantial majority of protected speech. So the most extreme examples are helpful, but they're not gonna get you where you need to be. And the Nazis thing is probably not the way to go. Just on pure tactics, find something else. The court continues. Even if, if we focus instead on the statute's facial requirements, the language renders implausible many of the platform's extreme hypothetical applications. The law expressly permits platforms to censor any unlawful expression. So true threats, CP, you know, solicit actual solicitation. You can do that because that's criminal. And certain speech that incites criminal activity or constitutes specific threats. Not to mention any context that platforms are authorized to censor by federal law. So a lot of those examples kind of disappear because the statute itself addresses them and also, of course, allows any censorship that would be allowed by federal law, not that Texas really had a choice anyway. In short, Section 7 chills no speech whatsoever. To the extent it chills anything, it chills censorship. Thus, Section 7 might make censors think twice before removing speech, but, you know, we don't care. All right, we now turn to the merits of the First Amendment argument. The First Amendment protects, prevents the government from enacting laws, abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And that sure does. Twitter, of course, is not the government, but, and Twitter, of course, has its own First Amendment rights. So we have to consider whether Twitter's First Amendment rights are at stake here, and if so, to what degree. So let's do that. As originally understood, the First Amendment's speech and press clauses protect the freedom to make well-intentioned statements of one's thoughts, particularly on matters of public concern. Yes, that's true. And the First Amendment sort of hierarchy, different kinds of speeches, different kinds of speech has different kinds of protection. We care more about restrictions of different kinds of speech. And what is at the very apex as it relates to freedom of speech? The political speech particularly criticisms of the government, because that would be the thing the government would have the greatest interest in restricting, naturally. So, yes, your ability to make well-intentioned statements of thoughts on matters of public concern, that is that is the core of the First Amendment, correct? It protects other things, but that's the most important thing. 
The platforms neither challenge this understanding of the First Amendment, that'd be hard, nor suggest Section 7 runs afoul of it, which would also be hard. The apparent concession is unsurprising. Section 7 does not operate as prior restraint on their speech, even one if one accepts their characterizations of censorship as speech. Section 7 does not prevent anyone from expressing their good faith opinions on matters of public concern, precisely the opposite. Section 7 protects Texans' ability to freely express a diverse set of opinions through one of the most important communication mediums used in the state, and it leaves the platform similarly free to opine. That is, they can still say whatever they want or decline to say anything about any post by any user. So to the extent that the social media post providers wish to use their freedom of speech to condemn or distance themselves from other people's speech, that's perfectly fine. No problem. You can, you can decry it. That's fine. You don't have to show your support of it. Moreover, Section 7's exceptions, where viewpoint-based discrimination is still permitted, like certain threats of violence, and I'm not sure I agree with that, really, as a viewpoint-based censorship because that's just true threats and now you're outside the First Amendment analysis. So if you're outside the First Amendment analysis, you don't talk about viewpoint because that just doesn't make sense. You only talk about viewpoint-based discrimination if you're within the First Amendment analysis. If you're talking about true threats, you're outside and so you can stop thinking, but whatever. Where viewpoint-based censorship is still permitted, like certain threats of violence, contemplate malicious bad faith speech not protected by the First Amendment as originally understood. Okay, I mean, there's something there. There is something there. The First Amendment is at its core, as the Fifth Circuit is reasoning, trying to reach for well-intentioned, good faith, disagreement, principally politically-based disagreement, because we are a constitutional republic. In addition to freedom of speech, of course, we also have the right to petition our government for redress of grievances. And so we, we exercise our political power as a country through speech. That's basically the principal mechanism to convince each other and convince our elected representatives, and if not, of course, convict, con convince our fellow citizens to vote for someone else who will do a better job of representing our view. The, the, the republic, to some degree, is speech, political speech, disagreement over issues. So, and it is not, the principal part of the First Amendment isn't to deal with bad faith, malicious actors. That's not the principal purpose. The principal purpose of it is to further the reaching for the zenith of, you know, philosophy, I suppose. So yeah, not so much with restricting good faith opinions, precisely the opposite. Section 7 protects the ability to express a diverse set of opinions through one of the most important communication mediums. Yeah. Rather than mount any challenge under the original public meaning of the First Amendment, the platforms instead focus their attention on Supreme Court doctrine, which, you know, to be perfectly fair, is a very good place to go. The Supreme Court has opined quite a lot over the years on the First Amendment. Every year, the Supreme Court hears a couple First Amendment cases. Uh, speaking just purely personally, I wish they would adopt similar attention to the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment needs love. The First Amendment has had a lot of love over the last couple decades, and there's a lot of case law on the First Amendment. Not to say that, that there, not to say there isn't more to be done. There is more to be done, but maybe a little love towards the Second Amendment would, wouldn't wouldn't go out of place. But I digress. Under the doctrine, the platforms contend Section 7 somehow burdens their right to speak. How so, you might wonder? Section 7 does nothing to prohibit the platforms from saying whatever they want in whatever way they want to say it. The platforms contend that when a user says something on the platforms, the act of hosting or rejecting the speech is the platform's own protected speech. So we can say whatever we want or not. That's not the problem. The law doesn't even attempt to address that in any way. The problem isn't that we can say whatever we want or not. The problem is that we are forced to host speech and the the hosting itself is our speech. Oh, okay, let's give that a try. 
The Supreme Court precedent instructs that freedom of speech naturally includes the right to refrain from speaking. Of course it does. Every right naturally includes the right not to exercise that right. You have freedom of speech and not speech. You have freedom of religion and not religion. You have freedom of stuff. You have freedom and not that. It's up to you. It's your right. That is the nature of rights. The state may not force a private speaker to speak someone else's message. Yeah. But the state can regulate conduct in a way that requires private entities to host, transmit, or otherwise facilitate speech. Were it, were it otherwise, no government could impose non-discriminatory requirements on, say, telephone companies or shipping services. So again, showing the reasons that you can't take this to the edge of the page. Like, why, why is this a problem? Why can't they make the decision on who to host or not? Well, if they could, if they had, if they had all the power to decide who they host, because again, First Amendment, right? First Amendment. So if the First Amendment gave them all the power to decide who to host, they could decide who to host or not for any reason. How about a civil rights statute on non-discrimination? Not so much. Not so much because statute necessarily must bend to constitution. Constitution beats statute. The constitution is the supreme law of the land. So can Congress pass a law that requires the telephone companies to be non-discriminatory? Can they require them to provide service to all speakers regardless of the speech? Can Congress pass that law? Well, if the First Amendment says you have the right not to speak and that means also you have the right not to host someone, then Congress can't pass that law. They can't pass that law. The telephone company couldn't possibly be bound by that law, but we know they can because of the case law. So we know that hosting speech, at least in some contexts, is different from speech. That is the nature of telephone companies, for example, or shipping services. We can require non-discrimination. If, if the right to refuse hosting someone was a First Amendment right, a state could not create a right to distribute leaflets at a shopping mall. But see Pruneyard versus Robbins, U.S. Supreme Court, upholding a California law protecting the right of a pamphlet pamphleter in a privately owned shopping center. So California, in its wisdom, passed a law that requires private shopping centers to allow people to distribute pamphlets. The shopping center must allow the pamphleteers access to their parking lots. Again, there are some regulations around this. It's not completely open anarchy, but within the bounds of the rules, you can go into a parking lot as a person trying to hand out pamphlets or whatever, and the shopping center cannot trespass you. They cannot invoke their private property rights and say, hey, you're not allowed on my private property. Trespass. Nuh-uh-uh, says California. Now, private property rights as it relates to land can be subject to regulations under Fifth Amendment taking. If we're thinking about, ah, they're taking the land. Well, we know from the relevant case law, or at least I know from the relevant case law, I know from the relevant case law that when it comes to regulations on property, the regulations basically have to destroy all the value in order for it to be a taking. There are all kinds of regulations on property. For example, in the parking lot example, I just mentioned just now where how many parking spaces you need, how big the parking spaces need to be, how well lit they have to be, what ingress and egress they have to be, how big the lanes in between them have to be, and so forth and so on. Those are all kinds of regulations dealing with parking lots. You know, all kinds of regulations. So if we're thinking about this, okay, can, can the state impede your right to your land by forcing them onto your property? 
Well, again, yes, because the relevant case law seems to support that proposition. Seems to support the proposition that the government can regulate a lot of your property without it being a taking under the Fifth Amendment. So that's no good. Okay, so your Fifth Amendment argument didn't work. What's next? Okay, freedom of speech. The problem isn't that they're trespassing on my land. The problem is that they are speaking messages I don't want to be spoken. They are handing out pamphlets I don't want to be handed out. So my Fifth Amendment argument didn't work. How about the F F First Amendment? The Supreme Court of the United States says, nah, 1980. Supreme Court of the United States says, nah, 1980. You can't, grocery store, forbid them from coming onto your property to hand out pamphlets you don't agree with. No, nah, you can't do that. That is not within your First Amendment rights. No problem, says the Supreme Court. That's case law. And again, this is a really good example, by the way, to show why, again, you have to think about where does it stop. If I can impress upon you through this channel any one concept, it's thinking ahead, thinking ahead about where things stop. Because when it comes to common law, it never stops. It never stops, ever. Because when you create something, someone's going to use that and they're going to build on it and they're going to build on it and they're going to build on it. And you fast forward years or decades or centuries or even millennia and suddenly things have moved on. So you have this case from the U.S. Supreme Court that says, okay, private shopping centers, you are required to host the pamphleteers. Can we think about how that case law might have application to our immediate issue? Can we think how the private property right argument from Twitter is analogous? Can we think how the First Amendment argument from Twitter is analogous, comparable, an extension? I can. This is where this is why you have to try to think ahead. Where does it stop? So the First Amendment doctrine permitting, permits regulating conduct of an entity that hosts speech. Hosts speech. You can regulate that. But generally forbids the host itself to speak or interfere with the host's own message. There is a distinction the Supreme Court recognized. You can be forced to host speech shopping center. You can be host to you can be forced to host speech grocery store. You can still speak yourself. You can speak or not. It's up to you. But you don't have complete rights over who you host. Grocery store. Hey, Twitter. How's that uh, case law looking right about now? Cal yeah, how's that looking right about now, right? Okay. Pressing on. Unlike the precedents, a speech host must make one of two showings to mount a First Amendment challenge. So the precedents they were just talking about that we just skipped dealt with when it was their own speech. But now we're going to talk about a host. What does a host have to show? It must show the challenge law either compels the host to speak or forbids it from speaking or restricts their own speech. That is the relevant law. Does it compel you to speak? Does it restrict your ability to speak? The platforms cannot make either of these showings. They can't. The grocery store can put up a sign. The grocery store can put up their own messaging. The grocery store can pass out their own pamphlets. The grocery store can condemn the people. The grocery store can speak or not. It's different. Glow gives 999 and says, help, I don't know how to become a member. Well, my friend, I'm happy to help you with this problem. If you want to become a member of this channel, and it could not be easier, my friends, all you have to do is hit the join button on your screen. Now you might be saying to yourself, ah, I am on an Apple device and I don't see a join button. Not to fret, my friends. The, the link to join is in the description of this channel. 
It's in the description of this video. And it also is given to you by the bot from time to time, which will say, give you a link to join the channel. So either do one of those things, click on the join button or click on the link in the video description or click on the link that the bot tells you about from time to time. These are some of the ways to join the panel, uh, join the channel. And I do appreciate every one of you who becomes the uncivilians. Can a, someone ask, can a store put up a sign that says no pamphlet distribution? Sure, it just doesn't have any legal impact. But they can put up the sign. Yeah. Let's start with compelled speech. In Miami Herald, the Supreme Court held that Florida's right to reply law was unconstitutional because it compelled newspapers to speak. So in Miami Herald, there was, an, there was a forced opportunity to respond to an op-ed. If you were the target of an op-ed, you were, the newspaper had to, was required to host your counter. So the Supreme Court said, nah, not so much with that. Thus, when a newspaper affirmatively chooses to publish something, it says that particular speech at the very least should be heard and discussed. So forcing a newspaper to run this or that column would be tantamount to forcing the newspaper to speak. Because the newspaper made the decision to run the original op-ed. The newspaper made the decision to run the original column. They made the choice. They made the choice. And so forcing them to host something else would be forcing them to make that same choice. But the platforms are nothing like that because unlike the newspapers, the platforms exercise virtually no editorial control or judgment. Everything that goes into a newspaper, someone made a decision to put that into that newspaper. Nothing just kind of goes there. The newspaper makes decisions about what goes in the newspaper for all the content. Social media, not so much. They don't make the decisions they don't make a judgment. The platforms use algorithms to screen out certain obese and spam related content. And then virtually everything else is just posted to the platform with zero editorial control or judgment. That's very different than a newspaper. That is factually distinct. Something well north of 99% of the content never gets reviewed by a human being. The content on the site is to that extent invisible to the platform. So very, very different from the newspaper, where 100% or maybe 99% of what goes on the newspaper is because the newspaper made the decision to allow that. They made the decision to print that. They made the decision before it got printed. They made the decision before it ever got put on the page. 99% or 100% of the time, as the social media companies, not so much. Everything gets sent on the page and nary a decision is being made. Very different. The platforms, unlike newspapers, are primarily conduits for news, comment, and advertising. And that's why the Supreme Court has described them as the modern public square. Yeah. The platform's own representations confirm this. They've told their users we try to explicitly view ourselves as not editors. <laughs> Get a newspaper to say that, right? We don't want to have editorial judgment over the content that's in your feed. Again, find a newspaper that says that. Find a newspaper that says we view ourselves as not editors. We don't want to have judgment over what appears in the newspaper. Find a newspaper who's making those statements. No. They've told the public that they may not monitor, do not endorse, and cannot take responsibility for the content on their platforms. N newspapers don't say that. They've told Congress their goal is to offer a platform to all ideas. And they've told courts over and over again, they simply serve as conduits for other party speech. Again, a newspaper isn't gonna say these things. A TV network isn't going to say these things. A radio station isn't going to say these things. They never would ever say these things. But social media does. So maybe social media isn't like a radio in this respect. Maybe it's not like a television station in this respect. Maybe it's not like a newspaper in this respect. Maybe it's something different in this respect. 
again, when you're thinking about law, we do, com we do compare and contrast in law is one of the ways we think. We think by analogy, we reason by analogy. And if you wanna treat different things differently, it helps to show why they're different, right? If you wanna treat two different things differently, it goes a long way to show why they're different. Okay, so why is social media different than a newspaper, or different than a radio station, different than a TV station? Here's some reasons why. Oh, okay. All right, so it's making a lot more sense to treat them differently. All right. It is no answer to say, as the platforms do, an observer might construe the act of hosting speech as an expression of support of its message. The platforms be like, hey, if we're hosting it, people might think we're behind it. But remember that pesky, pesky shopping center case? Oh yeah, that was the exact contention the Supreme Court previously rejected in the shopping center case. We're hosting it, people might think it's our speech. Supreme Court's already said too bad, oopsies. Someone chat says, is this akin? Joseph says, is it akin to common carrier versus private carrier rationale? It seems they're straddling these principles. Thoughts, love your show. Well, Joseph, yes, it is very akin to common carrier analysis and, this, and the court is going to get there in some more explicit language. They're going to address that in more expressive things that Texas has basically designated them a common carrier. And they're gonna show why they can do that by of course, citing precedent. Why can Texas designate them a common carrier? Oh, we've got case law. I've got case law in your case law. I hope you like case law. Thank you, Joseph, for your very kind super chat. It is appreciated. And thank you, Patricia, for the orange hearts and cowboy hats. They speak to me. That is that is my love language, orange hearts and cowboy hats. It is appreciated. Recognizing the compelled speech analogy to newspapers is a stretch, the platforms turn to parades. Okay, how about a parade? The platforms contend that Section 7 forces them to host speech that's inconsistent with their corporate values. Ooh. But of course, the platforms do not contend that they curate user speech a way a parade sponsor would. Again, show me a parade organizer that's not trying to curate who goes into the parade. Some people, some parade somewhere might say anyone who shows up. But even if they do, that's an active choice they make. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Show me a composer, show me a producer of a show that just like, oh, anyone who happens to show up is fine. Yeah, no. Nor do they suggest that they are intimately connected with communication. The platforms instead, their censorship is protected because the case law creates a free wheeling right for speech to discriminate against messages they don't like. The Fifth Circuit says the case law says nothing like that. The court, referring to the Supreme Court at this point, instead carefully limited its holding to a speech host, like a parade organizer or a composer who's intimately connected with the speech. So yeah, you can't force someone into your parade. You can't force someone into your composition because the parade organizer is pretty intimately connected to the speech. They are vetting who is or is not going to be in that parade. They are making choices. They are making choices. And so forcing the parade organizer to make a choice to host someone else is akin to a newspaper. The parade organizer is more like a newspaper than social media in this context, because like a newspaper, they are making editorial judgment as to who will be in their parade or not. Right? So that, yeah. And the platforms are nothing like this. They don't pick content to make some sort of collective point, even an abstract one, like what merits celebration on St. Patrick's Day. This has been the case law, right? Can, can, for example, can, for example, gay people force themselves into the St. Patrick's parade? Right, non-discrimination. We were just discussing this earlier, right? Can we force them into the parade? Can we? Can Congress or the legislature or whomever it is passing non-discrimination statute? Okay, well, First Amendment though. First Amendment beats the non-discrimination statute because they are making after choices. They are making the choice as to who will be in their parade so they can discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, 
or race or pretty much any other criteria they want because First Amendment beats statute. That is the key. But unlike the parade organizer, the social media host isn't carefully curating much of anything. Yeah. If a platform censors a user's post, the expressive quality of that censorship arises only from the platform's speech, stating that the platform chose to censor the speech and explaining how the censorship expresses the platform's views. Otherwise, as in a different case, an observer might just as easily infer the user himself deleted the post and chose to speak elsewhere. In terms of conduct inherent expressiveness, there's simply no plausible way to distinguish targeted denial of access to only military recruiters, in the case law, from viewpoint censorship regulated by the speech. Again, how does case law impact this? How does it impact that? And in the military recruiters case, it was decided that the schools had to host the military recruiters. Again, they can speak out against it and stuff like that, but they had to host them. And so how can you distinguish that here? Not clear. So the Fifth Circuit is pulling Supreme Court cases, pulling analogies and making arguments that at least in my mind begin to make sense. It's like, oh, okay, this, this is beginning to track. The plaintiffs, okay, so then they talk about there's nothing that prohibits the platforms from speaking. First, the platforms have virtually unlimited spaces for speech. So Section 7's hosting requirement does nothing to prohibit them from saying what they want. This, again, is a way to distinguish social media platforms from basically any real-world equivalent. How are social media platforms different than newspapers, radio stations, television stations, the parking lot of a grocery store. How are they different? They have no space considerations. Parking lots have space considerations. Newspapers have space considerations. Radios have space considerations. Televisions have space considerations. You know, there's a limitation. There's a limitation. But social media, not so much. You guys are basically unlimited. Contra to, for example, the Miami Herald, where we were going to force you to run the column, which is a bit of a problem because paper costs money. So either you have to pay more money for more paper or you have to choose not to publish something else for the same amount of money. So either way, right, space is a limitation. Or PG&E, which involves forms of inherently limited scope, a newspaper and a newsletter, have significant space constraints. So when a state appropriated space in the newspaper for third party use, it necessarily curtailed the owner's ability to speak in its own forum because there's less space or it's gonna cost more. Either way, that's a problem. But so therefore when a speaker's own message is affected by the speech, it's forced to accommodate. The speaker may invoke the folk of the first amendment to protect their own ability to speak. But by contrast, space constraints on digital platforms are non-existent. Unlike newspapers, cable companies, and many other entities, platforms invoked by analogy. For this reason, platforms can host user speech without giving up any of their own right to speak. They are just as unlimited as they were before. The newspaper can't do that. The television station can't do that. The radio station can't do that. You can do that. You have unlimited space. Second, the platforms are free to say whatever they want to distance themselves from the speech they host. The Supreme Court has been very careful to limit forced affiliation claims by speech hosts. So one of the concerns was if you're a host, it's forcing affiliation. And of course, there is a right of freedom of association. Another one of those wonderful First Amendment rights, right? So how about freedom of association, right? We lost on our, if we're the grocery store, we lost on our Fifth Amendment taking claim. That didn't work. We lost on our First Amendment freedom of speech claim. That didn't work. Okay, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, right? We have the right to choose who to assemble with or not. Okay, so let's give that a shot. So the Supreme Court's been careful to limit that. After all, any speech a host could object 
its accommodations for speech might be confused as coerced endorsement, right? So maybe people think we're endorsed, but then again, there's that pesky, pesky shopping mall case, which we were like, nah, where the shopping mall owner was not required to affirm the expression in any way and free to publicly disassociate themselves from the viewer. So someone might think that you're that you're affiliated, but that I feel that is not enough in this context because you have the ability to counter them. And whatever the shopping center had the ability to do, social media has way more ability to do because of space is not a consideration. Similarly, in Rumsfeld, where we said the military recruiters get access to the students, the law schools argued if they treat military and non-military recruiters alike, they could be viewed as sending a message they see nothing wrong with the military. But the Supreme Court easily rejected this argument because nothing about recruiting suggests that law schools agree with any speech by any recruiters, and nothing in the amendment restricts what law schools may say about the policies. They're free to express their own views, and they sure do, let me tell you. Rather, to win the forced affiliation claim, the speech host must show that it's intimately connected with the communication and therefore cannot disassociate itself. See again, for example, the parade. The parade organizers pretty intimately associated with the parade. The conductors pretty intimately associated with the production. The product, the producers pretty intimately associated. The grocery store maybe not intimately associated enough with its own parking lot. Okay. Whatever, if that's too tangential, if the parking lot is too tangential from the grocery store, then how tangential is this? Pretty tangential. Platforms can add addenda or disclaimers contending their own speech to users posts, and many of them already do this, thus dramatically underscoring section seven prohibits none of the platform's speech. So yeah, that makes sense. Okay, great. The platforms do not seriously dispute any of this. Instead, they argue that Section 7 interferes with their speech by infringing their right to exercise editorial discretion. Their reasoning is as follows. Premise one is that editorial discretion is a separate freestanding category of the First Amendment. So first principle we're gonna try is that editorial discretion unto itself is a separate thing and we have separate First Amendment rights under that principle. Okay. Premise two is that the platform's censorship efforts constitute discretion, which would be necessary. It would have to fall within the thing we just created. And therefore, it would burn their rights. Well, I mean, I suppose if we accept the premises, the conclusion does follow. If we accept that editorial discretion is a freestanding right unto itself, and this is burning them, then yeah, that would be a problem. But of course, not so much because the premises are faulty. Premise one is faulty because the Supreme Court does not carve out editorial discretion as a separate category unto itself. Instead, the court has considered editorial discretion as a relevant consideration when deciding whether a challenge re regulation impermissibly compels or restricts speech. So it is not a separate thing unto itself. It's merely a factor among things. Okay. Accordingly, platforms cannot invoke editorial discretion as if uttering some sort of First Amendment talisman. So the, the, the magic spell is not editorial discretion. Editorial discretion. No, I'm sorry, the magic spell didn't work today. Sorry about that. Were it otherwise, the shopping mall and the law schools could have changed the outcome by simply saying editorial discretion. But of course, that would be ridiculous, and so it can't be. Instead, the platforms must show that the Section 7 either coerces them to speak or interferes with their speech. Of course, how platforms do and do not exercise editorial control is relevant, as it was to the newspapers, but, so it is a relevant factor, just like it was before, but it's a relevant factor, not a separate thing unto itself. So the platform, platforms can't just shout editorial discretion and declare victory. No, no, it's a factor. It's a factor we considered, but there were other factors. What other factors? Well, the ones we've been discussing for a hot minute now. So then they go on to say, even assuming editorial discretion is a freestanding 
argument, our freestanding category. So we'll grant your premise for the moment. The platform's censorship doesn't qualify. So even assuming editorial discretion is a thing unto itself, what you're doing doesn't fall within those categories. The platforms never define what they mean by editorial discretion, which is kind of difficult. If you're going to use a terminology, it helps if it has a meaning. Yeah. Instead, they simply assert that the exercise protected editorial discretion sounds a little uh, tautological. Tautology is tautology. The first rule of tautology club is the first rule of tautology club. Instead, they simply assert the exercise protected ex editorial discretion because they censor some of the content posted to their platforms and use sophisticated art algorithms to arrange and present the rest. But whatever the outer bounds of editorial discretion might be, this censorship falls outside of it. It doesn't help that you can't define what it is. That's a problem. Second, editorial discretion involves selection and presentation of content before it's hosted. Yeah, again, again, assuming editorial discretion is a thing unto itself, when does the editing occur? When does the editing occur? Does the editing occur before the speech or after the speech? Well, let me think about it. Uh, when it comes to newspapers or television stations or radio stations or pamphlets or magazines, do the editorial decisions occur after the speech occurs or before? Uh, at least in the pre-internet age when stealth edits were not a thing, before. Before. The radio decision makes the decision what to play before they play it, not after. The newspaper makes the decision what to publish before it prints it, not after. The parade organizer makes the decision what to include in this parade before the parade occurs. Editorial discretion comes before publication. So this is an editorial discretion because not so much. The platforms do not choose or select material before. They engage in viewpoint-based censorship after. That is not what an editor does. The platforms offer no Supreme Court case even remotely suggesting the after-the-fact censorship constitutes editorial discretion that would be similar to the before-the-fact, because that would be dumb. They instead baldly assert that is constitutionally irrelevant at the point in time that they execute editorial discretion. It's constitutionally irrelevant at what time they exercise editorial discretion. Well, it might be constitutionally irrelevant at what time you exercise discretion, but I don't know if it's so much constitutionally relevant as logically relevant at what time you edit can't really edit after it's a little a little late once it goes outside the door a little late to uh change things y yeah not only is this assertion unsupported by authority but it's illogical yeah in some even if editorial discretion is a protected category unto itself it's far from clear why even viewpoint agnostic content arrangement and even equal infrequent and ex post censorship should qualify. Yeah. Your arrangement, by the way, social media organizations has been viewpoint agnostic, it seems. The algorithms don't care. And yeah. And in any event, the Supreme Court has never recognized editorial discretion as a freestanding category. And again, even if it did, this isn't that. Rather, the applicable inquiry is whether Section 7 forces the platforms to speak or interferes with their speech. Does it restrict you? No. Okay, so go away. This, this line of argument makes sense to me. This line of argument makes sense to me. I'm finding these analogies and comparisons to be pretty persuasive. I'm finding these rationales to be pretty logical. 
I'm finding these citations to the Supreme Court to be reasonably analogous. This is a solid line of argument by the Fifth Cir Circuit. Why can we do this for the social media groups? Here's a whole bunch of reasons. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. We're not done yet, of course. We have no doubts Section 7 is constitutional. And then, and then we're going to get to perhaps my favorite part of the whole thing. We're going to get to my favorite part of the whole thing because we're going to beat the social media companies to death with Section 230. Hey, social media companies, do you know, do you guys remember how you guys have said over and 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 over how you are not the speaker because of Section 230? Do you remember that? Do you remember the part where you said it wasn't our speech like all the time because of Section 230? So, oops, right? Because our First Amendment right is being, in, in, is being impacted because it's, in, it's impacting our speech. But wait a second, it's not your speech. You've said it's not your speech. Lots. You, you said it's not your speech. Lots and lots. So, yeah. So even if there was a problem, 230, yeah. Section 230 provides the platforms shall not be treated as publisher or speaker. You are not the speaker. So it's not your First Amendment because you are not the speaker. The First Amendment only applies to your speech. So yeah, Section 230 reflects congressional judgment the platforms do not operate like traditional publishers and therefore are not speaking. Congressional judgment reinforces our conclusion. They are not speaking within the meaning of the First Amendment. Yeah. Congress instructed no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another provider. Twitter is not the speaker because except for Twitter's own tweets on their own accounts, they are not providing the content. They are not the speaker. Section 230 therefore undercuts the argument holding that censorship is protected speech. How, how can it be? It's not your speech. Recall that they relied on two arguments. First, they suggest user submitted content they host is their speech, which no. And second, they argue that they're a publisher akin to a newspaper. Section 230 says not to either one of those. You're not the publisher or the speaker. So, no. So if Section 230 is constitutional, which, you know, it is because we've had this argument more than a couple times over the last couple of years. Is, is Section 230 constitutional? Yes. So if it's constitutional, then... How can a court recognize the platforms are the protected speakers of the content they host? That's a great question. If Section 230 is constitutional, which it clearly is, because it's been challenged lots, and the social media companies have certainly fought through hell and high water to say it's constitutional and won many a time. So if it's constitutional, and if they're not the speaker, then how can they be the speaker of the content they host? So the platforms have a wonderfully interesting argument to get around this problem. I mean, someone really put on their creative lawyer hat, right? It's because it's like, you have a problem here, right? Section 230, which you've gone out of your way many times to say, says you are not the speaker or publisher of that content. You want to now say you're the publisher or speaker, at least to the extent that you censor it. So how can you have both positions at the same time? You want to know how you have both positions at the same time? 
Okay. This is this is this is this is some top-notch luring. How can we do both things at the same time? Okay, let's do that. The platforms argue we can have our cake and eat it too, because they are, after all, in fact, the speakers. Okay? They are in reality, in fact, the speakers. But Congress simply instructed the courts to pretend they're not. Oh, okay. That's how we solve the problem. So it isn't that we're not the speaker. We totally are and totally have been all this time, which comes as a massive surprise to literally all of us. And also the section 230 text, which clearly says the opposite of it. But despite the text that says exactly the opposite of that, and despite the, the fact that the, we, this, these social media companies have gone to court like basically every day for the last 30 years or whatever it's been at this point, and said, we are not speakers. We we were mistaken this whole time. We are just now coming to, to realization. As it turns out, as it turns out, we are, we were in fact the speaker this whole time. We are totally the speaker, it is totally our speech. Congress just simply said to pretend we're not. I I I, I admire the cojones on whatever lawyer came up with this and convinced someone to say it with a straight face. This is, this is great shit. Uh, yeah, the legislature can't define what constitutes speech under the First Amendment. Th that's true. If it could, it could simply abrogate Miami Herald by declaring that newspapers are not publishers. So they want to say that uh, that uh, the 230 is unconstitutional or unconstitutional to the point that they're not the speaker. It's just that we're all going to pretend they're not. Okay. The First Amendment generally precludes liability based on the contents of someone else's speech, but defamation liability is an exception and has been forever, and it's not an exception merely for newspapers. It's an exception for anyone. It's called the republication rule, right? Generally speaking, you're not liable for someone else's speech, but if you're the one publishing it, even if you're not the one who said it, you're publishing it, right? So what someone else has said isn't your business until you make it your business. So if you're a newspaper, for example, or a radio station or a television station or whatever, and you make the decision to publish that, well, now you're the publisher. So republication. So you might not have been the originator, but you know, all that good stuff. Horse, Wolf, Horse Welfare donates $4.99 to say what lawyer will be organizing a class action lawsuit against Twitter for all the people they banned for posting their viewpoint. Well. The statute doesn't really allow for that. It allows the attorney general to act and get uh, injunctions. But uh, so I guess your answer is the attorney general of Texas uh, would be your class representative, I suppose, in this context. But anyways, carrying on. So defamation for publishers is an exception because you're repeating it. So you're now the one saying it. You might not have been the first one saying it, but you're repeating it. So now you're saying it. you made the decision to repeat it. Section 230 creates an exemption from the exception. And it does so by stating they're not to be treated as publishers. Thus, 230 is nothing more or less than a statutory patch to gap in the First Amendment free speech guarantee. Given that context, it's strange to pretend 230's declaration, they shall not be treated as publishers, has no relevance in the First Amendment context. Yeah, that doesn't really quite work. Deference to congressional judgment is particularly appropriate here because the platforms themselves, as I've noted, have extensively, extensively affirmed, defended, and relied on the judgment. Ex extensive, extensively is not even covering the half of it. I mean, they have basically been saying nothing else than this for the last 30 years. So, yeah. For example, they've asserted 230 promotes the free exchange of information and ideas over the internet and prevents the inevitable chill speech that would occur if computer services could be held liable merely for serving as conduits for other party speech. Other parties speech. Other parties speech. Those social media companies have written. Consistent with judgment, they've told courts repeatedly. Yeah. They merely serve as conduits for other party speech and they use neutral tools to conduct any policy, processing, finishing, or arranging that's necessary. They have also repeatedly defended the wisdom of the judgment, arguing 230 makes it possible for every media, major internet service to build and ins ensure important values like free expression and openness. 
the, the social media companies have definitely said that many a time. The platform's position in this case is a market shift from their past claims. That's one way of putting it. It's a marked shift. That's one way of putting it, somewhat very mildly. It's a marked shift. Yeah. From their past claims, they're simply conduits. And whatever might look like editorial control is in fact blind operation. And then somewhat hilariously, two amici argue the platform should be judicially stopped from making this argument, which I am somewhat warm to. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. You can't for 30 years say in this, say in every court nationwide, in so many cases, it defies counting that you are not the speaker and then be like, oh, we're totally the speaker. So I'm, I'm pretty partial to the judicial estoppel thing. You can't make that argument. It's just dumb. The, the Fifth Circuit simply notes it's a fair point I think it's more than fair to be quite honest, but in any event, so they're just going to blow past that issue because we're not going to rule on that ground, but I think it's totally a valid ground. But in any event, the platform's frequent affirmation makes us even more skeptical of the radical switcheroo that they are in fact publishers and have been the whole time. Dragon Store gives New Zealand $5 and gives me a lemon, lemon with some sunglasses cheering me on. I, I honor your lemon with the sunglasses cheering me on. I feel validated by said lemon. Thank you. I appreciate it. For the f for the 500 of you who are currently watching, by the way, thank you for being here, as always. I hope you're finding this informative and fun. I find it fun. I think this is great. I think these arguments are great. I think the Fifth Circuit's doing an amazing job, and I hope we're all learning a lot about how the social media companies are trying very desperately to avoid the consequences of their own argument to much hilarious result. If you are enjoying this content, may I ask you to kindly direct your attention briefly to the subscribe button and to verify what color it is. Has it, is it red or has it become red? If it is or has become red, the subscribe button is a little bit angry, but it is not a problem, my friend. You can merely click on the subscribe button and it will become gray and calm and peaceful and at one with itself and live in a world of harmony, which is what we all want. Make sure to click that red subscribe button today. Let's return back to the case at hand. The platform's only response in passing 230, Congress sought to give them an unqualified role of right of control in the content they host, including through viewpoint-based censorship. They base this argument on 230, which clarifies that platforms are immune from defamation liability if they remove certain categories of objectionable content. But the platform's argument finds no support in the text or context. 230 only considers removal of limited categories of content. So it is only if you're removing certain things obscene, excessively violent, and similarly based uh, expression. And there is a footnote here, which I will read this footnote because I thought it was interesting. Section 230 refers to obscene, lewd, lavicious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable. And boy, oh boy, have the social media companies really tried to cram their way into otherwise objectionable. As the Fifth Circuit notes, to the extent the platforms try to extract some sort of unqualified censorship right from otherwise objectionable, which is definitely what they've done, and definitely the overall thrust of the case law so far. That is foreclosed by the Supreme Court's repeated instruction that where general words follow specific words, the general words are can be screwed by only of the similar nature. This is definitely true. We have discussed this many times, right? It's the and other stuff provision. So the obscene, lewd, levitious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, and other stuff. What other stuff? Well, if we use our standard statutory construction toolbox that we use all the time, we know, and we should know, that uh, and other stuff means other stuff like the list before. Now, I will take note here that the case law to date has read and other stuff exceptionally broadly so i don't i i think the the overall thrust of the case law to date has been otherwise objectionable means whatever they want to mean that it is in fact unlimited but the fifth circuit notes that strictly speaking that isn't proper 
and it should be limited and also potentially teeing it up for the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court's never really spoken to these issues. They've been more than happy to let the appellate courts deal with it forever. All the case, all the 230 case law that's out there is really at the appellate level to the point, by the way, that Justice Thomas himself has written in, you know, concurring opinions or otherwise, he's written the Supreme Court should maybe take a look at it because they've never done that really. And so the Fifth Circuit is basically saying, hey, by the way, Supreme Court, and by the way, Justice Thomas, here is something that, you know, you could take a look at if you wanted to. So, fun. The Fifth Circuit concludes that the text says nothing about viewpoint-based or geographic-based censorship. Fair. Secondly, read in context, 230 neither confers nor contemplates a freestanding right to censor. Instead, it clarifies censorship to limited categories that does not remove the immunity. And this does not fall under their scope, which would arguably mean that the social media companies are on the hook for a lot. Because if 230 never meant that, the social media companies could be on the hook for what would have to be the biggest lawsuit in the history of ever. Because they would have lost their protection for all the viewpoint-based discrimination they've been doing, which there's a fair amount of, and people could sue over that now. They could sue over their speech being taken down because 230 never protected that. So, yeah. So rather than helping the platform's case, 230 undermines the claims they're akin to newspapers for First Amendment purposes. Yeah. In sum, 230 represents Congress's judgment the platforms are not acting as speakers. While statute, of course, may not abrogate constitutional rights, and we'll say it again, right, of course, every time, gotta always remember it, Constitution beats statute every time. Every time, Constitution beats statute, so 230 does not and cannot abrogate the First Amendment, of course. Congress's factual judgment about the role online platforms counsels against finding it. And constitutional avoidance is a well-established principle, so. And assuming that Congress's statutes are constitutional is also well-established, so. You know, there's that. And that's particularly true here because the plaintiffs, social media has long relied on it and vigorously defended it. So, yeah. Only to make a stark about face. Section 230 therefore reinforces our conclusion. Yeah, yeah, all, all those things. Just Me gives nine ninety nine to say, you're having such a good time reading. The media company is getting screwed with their own words. Glad to have you seeing fun. Thanks for letting us join in on the fun. You are most welcome, my friend. And I am, I am joyous a lot by by a well-reasoned argument. What, one of the things I think that you can say about attorneys in a general is that attorneys do like a very well-constructed argument. Even if they disagree with it, they, they like a well-constructed argument. And this is well-constructed from the Fifth Circuit. It makes a lot of sense. I'm enjoying the reasoning. I'm also enjoying the social media companies eating it a little bit. I'm not gonna lie, that's also part of it. So part of my joy is definitely the social media companies eating it a little bit but also because it's exceptionally well reason. There's many reasons this pleases me. Ricardo Aspinia says, since this is an appeal court, does this set precedent? Yes, yes, it certainly does. Yep, this is, now, this is now the precedent in the Fifth Circuit until of course, either the Fifth Circuit en banc or the Supreme Court changes it. And as the, as this, as the Fifth Circuit notes in its own opinion, it's at least partially in conflict with the Eleventh Circuit, which governs Florida, for example. So there is some conflict in the Fifth Circuit's opinion versus the Eleventh Circuit. By the Fifth Circuit's own admission, there's conflict. And so if you're looking for a reason for the Supreme Court to get involved, conflict between circuits is usually a pretty good one. It doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but of course, it doesn't hurt. So also, as I mentioned, Justice Thomas has openly put out calls. So this is just screaming for the Supreme Court's attention. Hey, look at me, look at me, I'm over here. So will the Supreme Court take it up? I don't know, but they could. And I think, you know, as cases go, it's, it's pretty well reasoned. The common carrier doctrine. Okay, so this goes to the earlier question that someone asked me, I believe it was Joseph asking me about common carrier. Well, here's the part for Joseph. 
asked about earlier, hey, is this similar to common carrier? Yes, it is, as a matter of fact. And the uh, Fifth Circuit is now going to explicitly deal with the whole common carrier thing on top of everything else. So let's reason by common carrier analogy. The common carrier doctrine is a body of common law dating back long before the founding. It sure is. It vests states with power to impose non-discriminatory obligations on communication and transportation providers that hold themselves out to serve the public without individualized bargaining. Right. The, the common carrier doctrine applies to transportation as well as speech and applied long before the founding. The common carrier doctrine, like everything precedes, well, like everything was overstating it, but precedes the Constitution. The platforms are communication firms of tremendous public importance that hold them out to serve the public without individualized bargaining. Section 7 imposes a basic non-discrimination requirement that falls comfortably within the historical ambit. So there are historical analogies, which always helps, right? We reason by analogy in law. It's one of the reasons that the lawyers freak out when precedent it gets established. It's one of the reasons why just this time doesn't really work as a legal argument because we're now thinking about things that happened hundreds of years ago. Are cases that happened hundreds of years ago relevant to social media? Hell yes. That is the nature of common law. In a lot of ways, the technology is just a different methodology. What they're doing in some ways is not that different or in some ways it is, but the analogy nevertheless is going to persist. The common carrier's duty to serve without discrimination was transplanted to America, of course, along with the rest of the common law, as you would expect. The telegraph, okay, so what do we, what can we say about common carriers as it applies to communication mediums? Because Twitter is a communication medium. So what, what communication mediums have we treated like a common carrier? Is there any analogy? at all out there to social media. Well, there is one, at least. How about the telegraph? Social media is the telegraph. Okay, let's give that a shot. The telegraph was the first communications industry that was subject to common carrier law. Invented in 1838, the telegraph revolutionized how people engage with the media and communicate with each other for the next half century. I mean, the telegraph was groundbreaking. It was revolutionary massively you could send a message cross nation or internationally instantly it was the first modern instant messenger instead of having to dispatch a horse and rider which was your option basically throughout all of history before this point communication technology before 1838 is the horse and rider that's what you got then someone came up with the telegraph. How about instant communication everywhere? Instant communication worldwide. So yeah, it's a little bit analogous. So it revolutionized how people communicated a, a little bit. By the end of the 19th century, legislatures grew concerned about the possibility that private entities that controlled this amazing new technology would use that power to manipulate the flow of information to the public when doing so served their economic or political self-interest. Well, geez, where does that sound familiar? Hey, we're concerned this brand new private communication technology, which just upended all of communication technology that existed basically for all of human history before this point. And we're concerned these private entities, industries that suddenly can communicate this massively revolutionary technology might use that power to manipulate the flow of information. Hmm, where does that sound familiar, right? <laughs> so these fears, of course, did prove well-founded. Social media didn't invent the censorship <coughs> based on viewpoint either. Social media, you know, nothing is new. Everything old, everything new is just old again. It's just history repeating itself. Social media is the telegraph. So. Yeah, much like social media before, Telegraph did exactly this. For example, Western Union, which was the largest Telegraph company, sometimes refused to carry messages from journalists that competed with its ally, Associated Press. 
Western Union, Twitter of its time, said, hey, we're not going to carry these messages because we don't like it because it competes with our competitor. We're not going to carry your message, says Western Union. Or it would charge them an exorbitant rate. Did you know that Twitter is just Western Union? It is. It's just Western Union. We've already done this once. And it was widely believed that Western Union and the Associated Press influenced the reporting of political elections in an effort to promote the election of candidates their directors favored. Hmm. Hmm. Western Union might be controlling or influencing or restricting speech in order to favor its own preferred political candidates. Hmm. Hmm. A Western Union is doing that. Can we think of any other companies that might be doing that <laughs> okay in response the states started to enact common carrier laws to limit discrimination in the telegraph they thought that maybe western union shouldn't be allowed to do that they thought maybe their ability to control political elections was a bit much the first such law which was passed by new york required the telegraph companies to receive dispatches from and for any individual and on payment of usual charges to transmit the same with impartiality and good faith. Hey, Western Union, we're the state of New York. We can't help noticing that suddenly you have this massive amount of power because people want to use your communication mediums. And suddenly you seem to be using this massive amount of power to communicate only messages you like and also influencing our elections. We, the state of New York, don't really like that very much. We are going to require you, Western Union, to receive the dispatches from individuals for any other individual on its usual terms and transmit it impartially. Everything old is new again. Rinse, repeat. New York further required such companies to transmit all dispatches in the order in which they were received. Congress, oh, and then they, so then, then they know many states also eventually passed similar laws. So we start with the states doing this on an individual state-by-state -state level. And then eventually Congress gets involved in the regulation of interstate commerce and ultimately itself mandated that telegraph companies operate their lines as to afford equal facilities to all without discrimination in favor of or against any person, company, or corporation whatsoever. So can we, can we, the state of Texas, Tell Twitter, tell Facebook, tell LinkedIn, tell TikTok, tell Western Union. They must receive the messages. They must transmit the messages on equal terms without discrimination on anybody. Can we do that? Yep, we can. Great. When, when state legislatures or state courts impose these common carrier requirements, effective firms try to bring constitutional claims. Everything old is new again. Everything old is new again. Let's discuss Twitter. Let's discuss Twitter. Twitter, in this case, is a company called Mun. It's 1876. Twitter's going by a different name in 1876. It's called Mun. Illinois passed a statute regulating ra railroads, among other things, requiring grain elevator rates and prohibiting race, rate discrimination. They brought a whole bunch of constitutional law complaints in 1876, Twitter did. The Supreme Court in 1876, Twitter says, hey, you know, not so much. The state legislatures may constitutionally regulate private firms if the service they provide is affected with the public interest. We can constitutionally regulate you by requiring you to apply equal rights if what you're doing is affecting the public interest. Mun, 1876, with the grain elevators. After Mun, the Supreme Court repeatedly upheld the common carrier regulations against constitutional challenges. Everything old is new again. We've done it. We've done it before. We've done it all before. 
It's all been done. Woo hoo hoo. It's all been done. Woo hoo hoo. It's all been done before. Texas permissibly determined that platforms are common carriers subject to non-discrimination. $10 from Joseph, who says, maybe in the weeds or in the case law, but can you speak to the idea that WU, one-to-one, -one, while Twitter's one-to-many, is that off-base, a distinction without a difference? Well, Western Union is one-to-one, -one, as opposed to other things? Well, is the fact that it's one-to-one -one relevant? So that's a good question. So the, is the fact that it's one-to-one -one versus one-to-many relevant? First of all, I don't know how telegraphs work. And I'm not sure, strictly speaking, the telegraphs are one-to-one. -one. I don't know for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me if they're not. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if telegraphs can be one-to-many. I, I think they typically were one-to-one, -one, but I, I don't think that, strictly speaking, they were always one-to-one, -one, although maybe I'm a little bit off base, but I mean, why would it change if, if assuming assuming telegraphs were always one to one? Why would that be a difference that would matter would be the question. Why is that in the nature of something that would change the analysis? So is it a distinction? Maybe is it a distinction that matters. Okay. Why does it matter? Why would it matter? That's one to one versus one to many Does it matter if it's two people five people ten people a hundred people does it matter and if so why so yeah yeah, I don't. I yeah, I I, I wasn't always one to one. I, I'm 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 pretty sure. I, I'm pretty sure that telegraphs were not always one to one because I'm pretty sure that nationwide newspapers. This is how they got their messages to localized printers to print their thing. It's how it's how there was nationwide newspapers because they would do one to many transmissions. I think, but I, you know, it could be a little bit off. But okay. Anyways, carrying on. To state the obvious, platforms are communication firms. The platforms half hardly suggest they're not members of communication industry uh, because their mode of transmitting, ex transmitting expression differs from what other men members do. I, I suppose in some sense maybe, but why does it matter? But that's wrong. The whole purpose of social media platform as aptly captured is to enable communication with other users. So yeah, your mode might be a little different in some ways, but why does it matter? The platform's own representations confirm this. Facebook's Twitter Terms of Service, for example, indicates its purpose is to enable users to communicate with friends, family, and others. In that sense, the platforms are no different than Verizon or AT&T, which have been regulated forever. So, yeah. And Joseph, I don't mind your question. I thought it was a great question. I thought it was a very intelligent question. I, I, I appreciate the question. It's like, okay. Is it a distinction? Maybe. And it's like, okay, why why does that distinction matter? Why is the distinction one to one versus one to many matter? And it's like, okay, well, I can't think of any obvious reason, but maybe there's something there somewhere. But why does it yeah, why would it change the analysis? I mean, yeah, it's not clear. And so, but I thought it was a great question, just a very sharp question. Well done. Joseph, you get plus one point from uncivil law for your intelligent question. You can exchange this and all the best on civil law stores. <laughs> Lol. Okay, carry on. The plaintiffs also hold themselves out to serve the public. They permit any adult to make an account, and we're anyone over the age of 13, incidentally, and to transmit expression after agreeing to the same boilerplate terms of service. They represent a willingness to carry anyone on the same terms and conditions. The platforms resist this conclusion, arguing they've not held themselves out to serve the public equally. Uh-huh. That is so they contend because they're only willing to do business with users who agree to their terms of service. But requiring compliance with reasonable rules and regulations has never permitted a communications firm to avoid common carrier. Western Union has terms of service, always has. The Pony Express probably had terms of service too. The relevant inquiry is whether or not they have terms and conditions. It's instead whether or not there's individual bargaining or not. Is it the same terms and conditions for everybody? Which, you know, yeah. So that's the standard. The platforms also contend they're not open to the public generally because they censor or otherwise discriminate against certain users and expression. 
To the extent platforms are arguing they're not common carriers because they filter some obscene, vile, and spam-related expression, this argument lacks any historical support. For example, phone companies are privileged by law to filter obscene or harassing expression, and they do. So to say that even the phone companies are forced to accept all transmissions is not quite right. The phone companies can act in some limited ways, for example, to provide denial of service attacks or to filter obscene or harassing messages, they can act. So there, there is some ability to act. So you're not completely without any recourse, Twitter. Yet they are still regulated as common carriers despite this ability. Similarly, transportation providers may eject vulgar or disorderly passengers. So can, American Airlines is a common carrier. Can they kick you off their airline? Yeah, if you're disorderly and violate their terms of service and stuff, as long as they're even, right? Uh, yeah, they're forced to accept everybody, but you can cause that to be revoked from you by being a jackass. So states may nevertheless impose a common carrier, even if they give you these limited abilities. American Airlines is a common carrier. AT&T is a common carrier. Does that mean that they can't do anything? No, that's not quite right. Are they nevertheless a common carrier? Yep, that's fine. You'll be fine, Twitter. The platforms, nevertheless, they cannot be regulated as common carriers because they engage in viewpoint discrimination. The very conduct common carriers, common common carrier regulation would forbid. Yeah, that's kind of the problem, though. We're, we're, we don't want you to do that. So, yeah, you're not common carriers because you engage in viewpoint discrimination. Yeah, but we'd like you to stop. This contention is upside down. It's a little upside down. The platforms appear to believe that any enterprise can avoid common carrier by violating the obligation. So AT&T could just stop being a common carrier anytime if they just chose to engage in viewpoint discrimination. This would be logically extendable, again, because we're going to the First Amendment, right? I mean, AT&T is regulated by statute and regulation out the ass. If our argument is First Amendment, because we can beat regulation or statute with First Amendment, if AT&T can sim it's simply, hey, AT&T, by this one, this one weird trick will allow you to censor people. These, these five simple ways to become not a common carrier, number two, will shock you. If AT&T could do that, then it would be a problem, but they can't because that would be stupid. So no, this is obviously wrong and would rob the common carrier doctrine of any context. The platform's contention also involves a hair, fair bit of historical amnesia. Oh yeah, there's that. As discussed earlier, telegraphs companies once engaged in extensive viewpoint discrimination. That didn't save their ass. The telegraphs beat you to it, ma'am. The telegraphs before regulation ever came into place were doing the viewpoint discrimination. That's kind of why the regulation came into a place. So yeah. So not so much immunizing you as actually providing the motivation for the regulation. And nearly every other industry has historically been subject to common carrier regulation initially discriminated against. It's one of the reasons that we require the common carrier because of your being discriminatory jerks. So no, that's not gonna work. Texas has reasonably determined the platforms are affected with the public interest. Numerous members of the public depend on social media platforms to communicate about civic life, art, culture, religion, science, politics, school, family, and business. To, to, to say that social media is a lot of communication. Uh, yeah. The Supreme Court in 2017 recognized that social media platforms for many are principal sources for knowing current events, checking ads for employment, speaking and listening in the modern public square, and otherwise exploring the vast realms of human thought and knowledge. Social media is the dominant although certainly not exclusive, but is the dominant means of communication. It is the modern public square, says the Supreme Court, I think quite reasonably. That's what it's become. The court's modern public square label reflects the fact that in-person social interaction, cultural experiences, economic undertakings are increasingly being replaced by interactions and transactions hosted or facilitated by these platforms. A little bit commerce 
speech, friendship, family, persuasion, picketing, pamphleting, concerts, protests, are very increasingly switching from the old public square to the new. I, I think to say that there is a public interest in the social media communication is a little bit, at least as much as would be equivalent to Western Union. So yeah. If anything, the platform's position as modern public square has only become more entrenched as the public usage has continued to increase and there is no end in sight. The centrality of the platforms of public discourse is perhaps most vividly illustrated by multiple federal courts of appeal decisions holding that replies to public Twitter feeds, public officials Twitter feed constitutes a public forum for the First Amendment purposes. It's, it's public square enough to prevent governmental action. These decisions reflect modern intuition that platforms are forums for discussion and debate and exclusion from the platforms amounts to exclusion from public discourse in a lot of ways. And for many, the platforms are also no less central to discussions about matters like school, family, and business than they are to debates about public science and religion. Yeah, very much so. The, very much so. And there is absolutely no end in sight. There is no end in sight. This is going to only continue. This will only more and more and more replace the real world. I, I think sometimes we forget how young social media is. I think the I think modern social media, I think the date that most makes sense to my mind, and obviously you could pick both different dates. So I'm not saying this is the end all be all. But I think for me, the date that social media begins is with the launch of the iPhone which, you know, happened about five seconds ago in legal time. And, you know, what was that, 2007 or 2012, 2010, something like that? When did the iPhone get released? And even then, they didn't have the App Store right away, so you could even make it worse and say it was with the release of the App Store when social media really began, in a modern sense. Y YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, for that matter, old social media, Friendster, they were around since, they were around since, you know, the time I started beginning the sentence. And, and look what has happened already. 2007. I think that's I think that's a good date for my mind to say this is when social media began with the invent of the iPhone. Just a personal opinion, but it's 15 years. It was yesterday. It was 15 years ago. It was this morning. <laughs> What's going to happen next? <laughs> it's also true that as each platform has an effective monopoly over its particular niche of online discourse. Many early telephone companies did not have legal monopolies, but as a practical matter, they monopolized their geographic area due to the nature of their business. This is sometimes called a natural monopoly. It's not a legal monopoly, it's a natural monopoly because it's really expensive, for example, to put a phone wire and the first one who does it has a competitive advantage and, you know, basically they just basically win by being first. Likewise with platforms, while no law of course gives them a monopoly, network effects have entrenched the company because it's difficult to impossible for competitors to, repl to rep reproduce the network. Now I think the Fifth Circuit is a bit weak here, but to say that they are dominant is one thing. To say that they are irreplaceable is, is not at all established. I mean, 
Twitter replaced someone who replaced someone. So did Facebook, so did LinkedIn, so did Instagram, so did Twitter, so, so did TikTok. How many of these companies will be around in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years? You know, who can say? Who can say? So this is part is a little weak, but of course their competitive advantage makes it difficult. And so they are at least, if somewhat, although I think in a weaker sense, comparable. So this part is a little weak, but the overall thrust is strong overall. So I can ignore one minorly weak part of the analysis. Academics have explored this concept in death, yeah, but to those familiar with the platforms, a few concrete examples can demonstrate the point. To effectively monetize, say, carpet cleaning instruction videos, a real niche, one needs access to YouTube. Uh, there's, there's some merit to this argument, but I think it's a weaker argument because will YouTube be around tomorrow? I mean, they're here today, but will they be around tomorrow? I don't know. They were, they were, they were, they were here yesterday, but they weren't here the day before. You know, YouTube, YouTube was here this morning, but and yesterday, but it wasn't here the day before, and will it be here two days from now? I mean, who knows? Again, in the sort of time frames we're talking about, right? It's it's all happening so fast. Who knows what the future will bring? Sports influencers need access to Instagram, and political pundits need access to Twitter. It's just that no answer to tell professional athletes that they can just post to a different, different platforms. As just as Thomas has pointed out, that's like telling a man kicked off the train, he can still hike to Oregon. The analogy is a little bit weak here, but we can acknowledge it's weak and press on with the less, rest of the strength. Third, platforms and their amici argue that they're not engaged in carriage. They claim at their core, the common carrier doctrine is about transportation of property that is carrying little th or literal things. Uh, Western Union would like to have a word, but rather than transport some physical thing, the platforms process and manipulate data. They claim this distinction between processing and carriage puts them outside the realm of common carrier. There's no basis for this. A distinction between literal carriage and processing and data obviously would not fit. Were that the case, telephone and telegraph could never have been regulated. Oh yeah. Telephone and telegraph aren't really moving physical things, are they? So, uh, yeah. so to make the purported distinction work, the platforms and amici ask us to conceive of telegraph and telephone as conveying a widget of private information as a discrete commodity project. project. Well, if that's what the telephone companies are doing, so are you. You're moving widgets of information too. We call them packets. Packets? Okay. Relatedly, the platforms argue even if they can be regulated as common carriers, Section 7 goes beyond the scope of the common carrier doctrine. That's because it requires more than simple carriage or hosting. It also prohibits censorship that denies equal access or visibility to or otherwise discriminates against expression. I mean, that's kind of what the Telegraph was doing too, but okay. This is simply another version of the argument social media is too complicated medium to bear common carrier non-discrimination obligations. Oh yeah, social media is just too different. Social media is not that much different compared to the telegraph as the telegraph was compared to everything else that preceded it. <laughs> I mean, if, if this telegraph is not too different to be regulated. Social media isn't. I mean, social media is just, the social media is just the telegraph. It's just the telegraph. It's just a slightly more complicated one. We're still, we're still sending, we're still sending dots and dashes on a wire. We call them ones and zeros now, but they're dots and dashes. Telegram is binary. Modern networks are binary. It's the same thing. So, yeah. Four doors, more Corgi becomes a member. Thank you. Jennifer became a member. Thank you, by the way. Brother Daniel became a member. Aaron became a member. Rolf became a member. Sandra became a member. Morgan became a member. Ricardo has been a member for 29 months, rocking it hard. Thank you for becoming the uncivilians. 
Oh, it's fiber optic instead of being a copper wire? Oh, okay. First of all, a lot of the internet doesn't occur fiber optic. Second of all, I don't think the fact is fiber optic is that copper is really driving the analysis. Oh, okay. It says fiber optic. That's definitely what's making it different. All right. That's, that's yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> Common carriers have not normally been able to discharge their duties by hosting or transmitting communications. Rather, they've been required to do so without discrimination. With impartiality and good faith as required by many state laws. States could even regulate telegraph companies to transmit all dispatches in the order in which they were received. Section 7 thus imposes ordinary common carrier non-discrimination obligations drafted to fit the medium. <laughs> Photons instead of electrons is totally different. <laughs> yeah, sure, okay, whatever. Yeah. It's smoke signals. Smoke signals are binary, right? It's either on or it's off, man. Smoke signals. It's binary. Goes deep. At bombs, the platform oldest the oldest ask us to hold that in long technological march from ferries and bakeries to barges and grist mills to steamboats and stagecoaches to railroads and grain elevators to water and gas lines to telegraph and telephone lines to social media platforms that social media platforms marks the point where the underlying technology is finally so complicated, the government may no longer regulate it. Just by saying the sentence, I feel dumber. But we may not inter this vulnerable and centuries old doctrine just because Twitter censorship tools are more sophisticated than Western unions. And are they? Are they more sophisticated than Western unions? I suppose in the sense that you don't have a human doing it anymore, but Automation is what makes it sophisticated. I mean, that's just the industrial age making it done by machine instead of by human beings. Is it really is what is is what Twitter does really that much more sophisticated than Western Union at base? I mean, not really. Not when you kind of boil it down. It's kind of the same thing. It's all old. It's all been done before. The fact that plaintiff the fact that the plaintiff's platforms fall within the historical scope of the common carrier doctrine further undermines their attempt to characterize their censorship as speech. As discussed at length earlier, the platform's primary constitutional argument is they so closely oversee their speech, and right away you know you're in trouble, that they exercise editorial discretion akin to a newspaper. Not even remotely close. But the same characteristics that make platforms common carriers, holding their communications out for the public to use on equal terms, and second, their well understood social and economic role as facilitators of other people's speech renders them not newspapers, but instead indispensable conduits for transmitting information. They're the telegraph, they're the telephone. Yeah, put differently, it's bizarre to posit that platforms provide much of the key communication infrastructure of modern life and yet conclude that each and every communication somehow stim still implicates their own speech. This is, yeah, the platform's argument is breaking down. I like this, I think it's well-reasoned. I think this argument can withstand scrutiny. I'm not saying it necessarily will. I'm not saying the Supreme Court necessarily will adopt this reasoning. I've certainly been wrong about this, what the Supreme Court will do before and surprised sometimes so, you know, but I think it's a very good reasoning. It makes a lot of sense. I find it very persuasive. I like this. I think the historical analogies make a lot of sense. I think the old school regulations make a lot of sense. It seems consistent with the law, which is what you want in a decision. Skipping much analysis that I didn't think to do because I don't care. Okay, so at this point, the Fifth Circuit's going to note there has been a, a disagreement with the Eleventh Circuit. This is important legally because, as I mentioned, the Supreme Court, of course, as we all know, doesn't have to hear appeals. But one of the key ways to get an appeal is to look for a circuit split. 
because then you have different federal courts. You have different federal law in different parts of the country, which is not great, right? You have the federal law is different in Texas than it is in Florida, even though it's federal law, it's still different in two different places. This is not great, but that's the nature of the circuit system. So one of the things the Supreme Court does is resolve this by, you know, citing what the answer is. So they're going to note there's this distinction because Florida has done some things. Now, now the Fifth Circuit feels that there's a lot of differences here that drive the analysis, but they also disagree with some of the reasoning. So they disagree with it both on the facts and on the law. So in 2021, Florida enacted its law, which sought to protect political candidates and journalistic organizations from censorship. So somewhat broadly similar, the 11th Circuit recently said injunction, and we're gonna say not injunction. So the 11th Circuit and us might be intention. The 5th Circuit notes that much of the 11th Circuit reasoning is thus consistent with, and then they talk about how they are dissimilar in many law ways. So they're, they're, they are dissimilar. So they say that much of the reasoning is consistent with or irrelevant, but we do have some points of disagreement. So they, they note the distinction between the Florida law factually. The Florida law prohibited all censorship of some speakers, while the Texas law prohibits some censorship of all speakers. So there was that different. Texas's law permits non-viewpoint-based censorship and censorship of certain constitutionally unprotected expression, which Florida didn't do. Florida didn't permit non-viewpoint-based censorship. Texas does. So that suggests the potential for a different constitutional level of analysis. Because now if it's viewpoint neutral, maybe we're thinking intermediate scrutiny instead of strict scrutiny. HB 20 applies to all speakers equally instead of singling out political candidates and journalists for disfavored treatment. These are, of course, highly relevant distinctions and are impermissible content or speaker-based law versus viewpoint neutral law. So yes, there are some factual distinctions that drive the analysis, at least in part, but not all the way. The Fifth Circuit notes that they part with the 11th Circuit on three key issues. The 11th Circuit says editorial discretion is a thing. We say it's not. We also disagree with the 11th Circuit that censorship is akin to the editorial judgment for reasons we've said. The 11th Circuit says editorial discretion is a thing. We say no. The 11th Circuit says the censorship is editorial discretion. We say no. We disagree with the 11th Circuit conclusion common carrier does not support the constitutionality of imposing non-discrimination. The 11th Circuit says common carrier is not a thing. We say it is. We disagree. Skip, 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 skip discussion. And then we get to the conclusion. So there is some legal distinction. The Fifth Circuit thinks a lot of it is factual, but not all of it. The Fifth Circuit thinks that they, the cases are at least legally in conflict. And thus, you think to yourself, ah, the probability of the Supreme Court hearing this just went up. And then you remember that Justice Thomas has been calling for an opportunity to look at 230. And you think to yourself, hmm, okay, well, it's a candidate. It's a, it's a, it's a candidate. So the Fifth Circuit concludes by writing the following. The First Amendment protects speech. It generally prevents the government from inter interfering with people's speech or forcing them to speak. We can't force people to speak. We can't force them to not speak. The platforms argue because they host and transmit speech, the First Amendment gives them unqualified license to invalidate laws that hinder them from censoring. And they say that license entitles them to pre-enforcement challenge. We reject the contention. We reject the attempt to extract free willing censorship right from the free speech guarantee. Platforms are not newspapers. Their censorship is not speech. They're not entitled to pre-enforcement review. And the law is constitutional because it neither compels nor obstructs the platform's own speech. 
The district court erred in concluding otherwise and therefore vacated and remanded with further opinion. And then there is a concurring opinion, which we won't read. There is no dissent. So this is a three to zero decision, I believe. Let me just double check before I say that definitively. There's some difference, obviously, in the legal analysis, but concurring on the judgment. Yeah, so there's concur in part and dissent in part, but they concur basically in the judgment. So that brings us to the end of this discussion. I thought that was fun. Joseph gets two dollars to say stone tablets are the only true medium. Word. Word. So I, I think this analysis is pretty good. I think it makes a lot of logical sense. I think it shows that that common carrier regulations are things that states do and certainly something Congress can do. That Texas has tried to establish this as a common carrier, that these are viewpoint neutral, that it's not the, not the platform speech as they have insisted many times, and that censorship is not speech and still affords the platforms the ability to prevent content that would be harmful to the network, like a DDoS attack or whatever. $5 from Ricardo Aspinilla. You know saying the First Amendment supports censorship would be like saying the Second Amendment supports banning nuns. And Joseph says, really enjoyed your coverage and insight. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Well, I thought this was a really fun one. And I really appreciate the 476 of you who are currently watching and are part of the stream. You guys want to do some Jackbox, but before we can do Jackbox, we have to talk about the new background because I want to, I want to talk about the new background. As you guys can see, I have changed the background by adding more and different color lights to make it even more and exciting and interesting. So as you guys will remember, it used to look like this. Turn off those lights and turn off this light. And then it just is a big field of blue, All right? Just a big field of blue. And it's a little overly blue. And I don't really like the way it looks under the counter with that color, it's just not really looking at all. So first of all, we didn't even start there. First of all, we started and we, we were filming for a long time with something like this. This is how we were filming basically forever. Right, normal colored lights in the background and just a normal beige kind of set and everything is beige and eh. and also I, it's like, you know, my skin is kind of going in with the background. I, I don't like beige anymore. Be beige is dumb. I don't like beige, this sucks. So we got some color changing bulbs and so said, okay, what if we change to this color? This is the one we were streaming with for a long time. And this is kind of a lot of blue. And then I was like, okay, what if we do a darker blue? Well, that's pretty dark. That's pretty dark, but, and it's just so blue. So how can we fix this exciting problem? Ah, if we got some LED strip lighting, we can fix that exciting problem by adding accent colors. What if we, under the counters, we had lime? Ah. And what if under the kitchen sink, we had some sort of red? Ah. And now it looks nice. I am pleased by this, this excites me. And of course, they could be different colors. They don't have to be these colors. So for example, under the counter, we were doing magenta tonight, but previously we were doing red. How about like a dark red? Ooh, that's exciting, we could do that. And on the kitchen counters, instead of lime, what if we went with like a yellow? Okay, that's kind of cool. So we can experiment with all kinds of different lighting now. And that's fun. So it's all exciting and fun. And then we could even do things like, and this is just so stupid. We could also do things like we can do color changing bulbs. So do you guys want to be at the club? Do you guys want to be at the club? No problem, I can help you out. Let's put on the club lighting and let's go ahead and just speed that up to make the color changing more, more clubby. Oh yeah. Now we're at the club, man. Club colors. 
Yeah. Do you guys want to? Do you guys want to? Do you guys want to party? How about party? Oh yeah. I'm excited about this. I'm more excited than is probably strictly speaking rational, but that's okay. I don't always have to be rational all the time. You, you guys feeling the party? I'm feeling the party. So good. <laughs> You love the lights? I love the lights, too. I love the lights. It's amazing what a little bit of lighting can do to change things, right? And we'll we'll play out with colors and we'll do things. We'll do a voice changer. I do technically have a voice changer. I've never actually used it before. Should we play with a voice changer? Let's play with a voice changer. Let's see. Now, how do I do this? Let's see. Um... Kurt is the new lighting color. Yeah. The lighting warms my face. Thank you. All right. So we got voice mod. All right. So let's see. Now, if I turn on this voice chat. Hello. Okay. I Let's see. Now, check one, two. No, okay. Let's see, how do I do this? <sighs> Voice changer volume, changes volume, general, soundboard volume. I do that. If I change it to something like this, does this work? Does this work? Probably not. Hmm, let's see. I've got to... No, that's not it. Let's see. Settings. Input. Okay, got input, output. Okay, the imp the output is wrong. All right, so I want to output it to the same output I normally use, which is what? Let's see. Properties. It's okay. So I change it to this and it would work. Let's find out. All right, so I change it to this, change the speakers that way. And then if I change, okay, if I, okay, so maybe if I change the desktop audio, let's see if this works, hold on. No, I don't know if it'll work if I change, can I change it to the mic? Thank you very much for your uh, gift membership, Sandra, by the way, that's very, very kind of you. Let's see, let's see. and interface, voice meter, Interface is real audio. If I change this to be... Real Tech 2.0 audio. Properties. Speakers, let's change it to the speakers. So speakers to the audio, change the device, change the speakers. Let's see, input mic. Check one, two. Did that work? No. Let's see. What's sending audio to the stream? Streamlabs? It's uh, OBS is sending a stream. So, okay. What if I, what if I click here myself? Check, Check one, two. Okay. So, so that, that did something. something. That, that did something. something. I'm, I'm not sure what it did, but it did something. something. Check, Check one, two, one, two. One, two. How's, How's this working out? out? Right, let's, let's see if I can hear myself. Check. 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 Oh, oh, yeah. Hello, hello everyone, everyone, and welcome, welcome to Uncivil Law. Law. Oh, yeah. I am your host, Uncivil Law. Law. Yeah. Let's, let's see if I turn this on, what this does. Check one, two. Check one, two. Is this better than normal? 
Check one, two, one, two, one, two. This one, this one is called Voice Enhancer. Is my voice enhanced? Is it better? Worse? Something? Okay. Let's see. Okay. Custom pitch. Oh, I can change the pitch. Oh, this is just too dangerous. Let's see if I change the pitch down. Check Check one, two. two. Oh, yeah. Bo, bo, bo. Oh, bo, bo, bo. All right, let's change it up. Check, 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 check. 100? 100. Do it 100, baby. I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Life is plastic. It's fantastic. You can touch my hair. Undress me everywhere. Imagination. Life is your creation. I'm, I'm happy I could help out with this, uh, this, this joyous, joyous content, content for you. you. I don't, I don't have the paid, paid version, so all, I don't have all the options. options. I've, I've got, got evil, ogre, and frankly, uh, which is Frankenstein. Can, can I reduce the balance of my voice and the effective voice? voice? Maybe. I'll, I'll work on it. But we've we got, got some options. options. Evil? Now I'm evil? Do I sound evil? Check one, two. Check, check one, two. Hello, everyone. Okay, that's pretty much messed up. Let's try ogre. Check, check. Oh, yeah, it's ogre. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure, sure about any of that, but okay. okay. All right. So, anyways. All right. That's enough of that. Yeah, you're hearing my normal voice over the effect. Yeah. I don't know how to fix that problem right now. I'll have to work on it. All right, I'll turn everything off. You guys want to do a, let's do a daybell chapter. You guys want to do a daybell chapter? Let's do a daybell chapter. We are continuing our coverage of daybell, the guy on trial, with some more wonderful readings from his book with commentary. The Great Gathering. When we last left the book, the US government had instituted a program where they're putting a chip in people's hands that has GPS location and allows them to store money and ID and other things. And the Mormon church is having a dispute over it. And our, our heroes over here are a little bit skeptical of the whole chip in the hand thing, even as basically all their friends and the community around them is installing it, including apparently 40% of the entire East Coast got the chip within four days. Yeah, so that's where we left things. And let's pick up, we are, we are still in chapter three, I think, of the Great Gathering, standing in the holy places. Okay. By the middle of March, Americans could use the chip to access almost anything. Cash was quickly becoming a nuisance. Grocery cashiers acted highly inconvenienced to even open the cash drawer. Most places still accepted credit cards, but a simple 30 second transaction now found cumbersome and time consuming when compared to the chip. On Emma's most recent trip to the grocery store, she noticed a new checkout lane with a sign that read Chip Express Lane. She watched as at least a double dozen people zoomed through the lines as fast as her groceries could be bagged. Meanwhile, the lang she was in crept along slowly. The woman standing in front of her grew exasperated. The wait is ridiculous. I'm getting chipped tonight. Within another month, many gas stations were chip only. School districts across the nation asked the children who were going to eat school lunch to be chipped before the new school year began. What are you going to do for our kids? Pack lunches for them every day, Tad asked. It looks like I'll have to, Emma said. 
By the way, a couple of other moms have talked about sto sto starting a homeschool group. What do you think? Wouldn't that be a lot of trouble? I don't care. I'm not going to let my kids get the chip. From the next room, Leah innocently started to sing, It's hip to get the chip. Yeah, yeah. Emma could hardly believe her ears. Don't sing that song in our home, she called out. Leah in the next room said, Why not? The kids sing it during recess. That doesn't make it right, Emma said. We're not getting the chip. Thus ends chapter three. It was a short one. All right, I, I seem to have lost about a hundred people. <laughs> I seem to have about lost a hundred people since we, we diverged off, but okay. I, I guess, uh, I guess I'll, uh, what do you guys want to do? Do you guys want to hang out some more? Let's see how many people are interested in playing games. Um, let's see if there's enough uh, people that are interested in it. I look chipper. Oh, thank you. What's going on here? It's... Is that the murder one? It's kind of the murder one, yeah. 87%? 23 people? Okay. There's some there's some interest in that. Expecting guests in a second, no offense. Are you okay with Lawner clips including in their Barbie Girl compilation? All things being equal, I'd prefer not, to be honest. People dropped off into the case, yeah. Yeah, there's just, let's see, 80% of 36, so that's like 20 something people. Yeah. That's not a lot of interest, and I'm not super keen on it. I think I'm just gonna end the stream instead, maybe another time. If you're liking the stream, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, do all the YouTube things, and all the rest of it. I hope all's well. Until later, my friends, I've been on Civil Law. Cheers, and goodbye.